A wonderful good morning. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Line and uh, Intertrust a lot for having me. Um, speaking in front of such a distinguished, brilliant, and high experienced group is both a challenge, but also an opportunity. And uh, I'm still working out aloud why you invited me as an expert for organizational design and large-scale behavioral change to speak here at the Data and Security Conference. But maybe we will work it out jointly during my speech. So um, um, Florian said actually something very interesting during, during the panel. Um, and I think, Florian, I have to contradict a little bit. And uh, what, what made me actually very humble this morning was, I mean, your quote was, without electron, nothing happens, right? Um, so I spent my morning in St. Peter's Cathedral today. And I think these guys see this a little bit different. Or maybe they are talking about different electrons. But um, I think a lot happened without um, electricity companies or utilities. Now. I would like to walk you today a little bit through the transformation journey of energy, why we did it, what we're doing, and how we did it, but also um, what are we embarking on into the future. So let me start with a question. If this works, it's the wrong one. So you all are leading people, right? And you all are being led, or maybe not. I don't know. Maybe you see this differently. Um, I would like to start with a question. How do you know that the conversations you are having with your employees are truly relevant to them? So how do you know that the conversations you are having with your employees are truly relevant to them? Why this is important? Because you have to be relevant to them. As in a world of data-driven business models, still talent is the um, ultimate competitive advantage. Um, and the challenge you face is a big one. And I would like to make this a little bit experiential, because my, you know my colleagues know I love data, I love uh, human behavior. But I also know that most of the stuff you remember is ex actually experiential. So let me make the challenge you face experiential. Um, let's assume we are one company. All of us in the room here are one company. Can you hear us? No? OK. So let's assume, let's assume for a moment. Um, It's okay. Can you hear me? Great. So let's assume for a moment we are one company. Yeah? Um, what, I would like, what I would like to have is, can you count, now starting over there, to five, and every fifth person stands up. Yeah? And then you start to count again with one. And every fifth person stands up. So can you... Ah, that's great. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Awesome. So, um, electrons. electrons, you know, flowing now. Um, so we start here to count with one. The next person says two, three, four, five. And every fifth person stands please up. So let's start here. Okay, so look around. Now, if we are one company, these guys are your challenge. <laughs> because these guys are the actively 
disengaged employees, <laughs> right? So bear with me, please, please stand up, stay standing up. So can the person to the left and to the right of the individual standing also stand up? Okay, to the left and the right, so you really stand up. So look around. Now this is really your challenge. Because think about, if we are one company in here, this is the group who is actively and passively disengaged in your organization. And this is the data. Thank you very much. Um, this is the data. And um, these are the data from, um, from Gallup. And you know, you are actually wasting talent in your organization. And it's about 500 billion is, is a business case behind this. Um, now the challenge you have Today, you have seen these, guy in this, these guys in the room here, right? So they stood up, you have seen them. The challenge is, in your organizations, you don't see them. You don't know them. And what is really amazing to me is the fact that everything in your business, you base on data, right? So everything you do, you base on data, you try to understand your customer better, you try to create more value, but the most valuable resource you have, your employees, you don't know anything about it. I don't know who recruited in the last six weeks a person. Did you base this recruitment on data? Or did you base this on your intuition? Highly likely you based it on your intuition. Now the challenge with this is, Intuition does not scale. Intuition does not scale. And why do organizations not go the path down to understand more about their employees? Because, you know, the experience is fleeting. Feelings is very difficult to grab. Um, it's complex. Humans or human decision making is, seem to be complex. And normally it's also invisible. You don't see it. Like you have seen the guys before, but normally you don't see them. And what's happening today is, um, as much as I like to be a future leader, I, I am not the future. You know, in 10 or 15 years, the guys who are today between 20 and 30, they will lead our organization. It's not me. And what are they looking for is very interesting and very, very different to what we are, uh, have experienced. They are all looking not for a paycheck. They are looking for purpose. They don't want to have a boss. They want to have a mentor. And they don't want to have a performance evaluation or a target achievement conversation at the end of the year. They want to be recognized, seen, and they also want to be evaluated every day, every week, ongoingly. And um, let's take Inochi as an example. In uh, 2020, 10,000 of our employees will be millennials. And they are a complete different group. They are looking for purpose. They live in networks. They, they want to be empowered. Um, they want to experiment actually with stuff and um, they are relentlessly about transparency and learning about all of this stuff. So this is the challenge and that's also the challenge for Energy. But Energy um, had an interesting journey. Um, you know, speaking about electrons and, and electrons flowing. In 2012, we actually realized that um, the business model of Utilities is dead. And now being a leader in such an organization which is existing for 100 years, where the founder, Hugo Stinnes, wanted to have affordable electricity in every household, where um, the idea was to light every house, and existing for 100 years where people are risking their lives when they work for us, because if you're in a mine or in your grid, it's actually 
threatening your life, and they had been with generations for us. So if you are as a leader in such an organization, and you're facing the situation that your business model is basically dead, you face a very interesting challenge. And I can tie this down to numbers. So here is um, a Sunday in March. And on this Sunday in March, the electricity price was minus 21 euros. So this means that people are being paid to take out energy and not feed energy in. So if you have a hydro pump power plant in the Alps where you pump water to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the peaks and then you can release it later on, you're actually in a very good spot because you're using energy out of the grid. You're earning money twice when you pump the water up and when you let it down. So we were in a situation where our business model was dead. Now, we asked ourselves, what should we do, right? Just to give an insight, um, the average employee in energy is 50 male, German, engineer, and since 20 years with the firm, right? So I'm already diversity <laughs> because I'm Austrian. So now you embark uh, on a journey with an, with an workforce, which is like I described it. And you think about when the electron traveling from the production to the consumer becomes free. And the value pool is not the electron itself. It's the information around. What has to change is the mindset you operate. Because if you tap into a digital world, the mindset has to be about prototyping, has to be about customer focus, has to be learning quickly. Now, if you have operated for the last 20 years a nuclear power plant, you do not want to rapid prototype there. Our whole organization is built around stability. So the challenge was, how can we actually change what we are doing and how can we lead an organization into a future which is fundamentally different to everything we experienced so far. The way we work in the past is not the way how we operate in the future. And what we actually worked out, it's not the what we do. We are great in what we do. But the mindset shift from operating a stable system to rapid prototyping is the fact that we, we change the how we do things, not the what we do things. And changing this is quite a challenge because, as you know, we are speaking about culture. Because what is culture? Culture is basically the way how we do things here. Yeah? So let's take your organizations. Whenever I join your organizations after a certain time, I will behave like you are behaving because that is what, what culture represents. Um, and if you take this a little bit further, what it actually is, culture is behavioralized values. And that's what we started to embark on to change. Meaning, when you want to change the culture, which is consisting of like in our uh, case, 45,000 people behaving in a certain way because there are certain mental models behind, you have to understand the mental models. The problem is, again, you do not have any data on this. You know, when, when someone asks you, um, how is your culture and can you share any data with me about your culture? Normally, it becomes very quickly silent. You don't have data. So we thought, because we're an engineering company, you cannot convince engineers without data. So we measured our culture. And how we did this is the so-called Organizational Health Index. It's a benchmark from McKinsey where your um, people, they're answering a couple of questions and then in about nine categories, you are basically getting results compared to either peers in the industry or to other industries. 
And what we experienced at this point in time, and this was 2012, that in five out of the nine categories, we were fourth quartile or third quartile. And if you, if you look at these, these um, categories, that is, that is really, really frightening. It's strategy translation, it's leadership, it's outward orientation, it's performance and motivation and trust. Now, these are leaders evaluating themselves, right? So our leaders evaluated themselves in five out of these categories, which are vital as being bottom quartile. So if you're in this situation, you might think about how are we gonna change this? How can we actually drive this change? And what we came up with is basically the idea to say, let's understand what are the mental models behind the organization which are actually blocking us to um, grow into the future, to grow into a successful future, and actually change the way how we work. And we identified four mental models which are challenging to us. The, num the number one was, I don't give critical feedback. You know, if you're in an in a, in a exp expert community, the expert gets promoted until the expert is on the very top, and you don't criticize experts. So what happens is you have a huge vertical power distance because these guys on the top, they have no clue what's happening real in the real world down there, and they don't want to because they are the experts, right? Um, the second one was, um, I don't optimize RWE, I optimize my own area. Now, if you think about the value chain of a utility, you have production, trading, grid to uh, retail. Both sides are regulated. So the only chance you have to optimize yourself is against your peers. So you create silos. But in a world where rapid prototyping, customer focus, and streamlining the flow to the customer is key, you will be far beyond any other competitor who is not operating in a, in a world of silos. The, the third one was, um, I stay below the radar and wait until it's over. You know, there is this great situation where um, you're sitting at your desk and you're working, and then an initiative from the headquarter comes. Yeah? So you're leaning back, you let the initiative pass, and then you start to work again. And it didn't matter if you're high or low performer. And you know what? I basically don't worry about the low performers, but we did not incentivize high performers at all. So whatever you did, it did not matter. Um, and the, the, the fourth uh, mental model we found, which is blocking us, was I need direction. That's quite crazy if you are talking to leaders and leaders are saying, I need direction. I mean, we are so busy with ourselves in a hamster wheel, we forgot to see the outside world. The EU decided 15 years ago to decarbonize. We were still building huge lignite power plants. Like, who the hell is the EU, right? They don't matter to us. So what we understood was, if these mental models are working on your team, are working on me and my, changing my behavior, the only way to change this behavior and the culture is that I start to change. So our key slogan was, change starts with me. If I change my behavior, the team will change, the organization will change. And I can tell you, Shit, it works. Why? In the meantime, we have about 25,000 employees through this transformation. 15,000 employees are currently undergoing this behavioral change. We have built up a team of 350 people actually doing this every day. Um, we are running 61 Enva waves. We call it the new way of working. And we have created half a billion cash flow improvements out of it, which is vital because whatever you do, in terms of transformation, it has to pay off. And it paid off also in terms of the organizational, organizational health index. What you see here is basically the data from 2016. So in most of the areas, we massively moved up. Um, we are in outward orientation and in trust in the top quartile. And we're also leading the industry within, with regards to this data. And um, after having done this for five years, I went to my board and I said, guys, 
Um, I love what I have done. I think it's great what we achieved. But to be quite honest, we are too slow. And they looked at me and said, why are we too slow? I said, look, um, we are creating every year 430 million cash flow improvements. One, we, one year quicker basically means a lot. Um, and the challenge is the data I have shown you now, the Organization Health Index, we measure once a year. So as a leader, once a year, you measure uh, the organizational health. Then for three months, you don't hear anything. Then you get the data back, and then you might do something or not. So what I said is, let's go a step further. What if we capture the insights in real time? What if the simple insights we provide are basically evidencing stuff we can immediately act on, and that led us to the idea that we go from annual surveys to real-time interactions. And we invested in a company which is called PLOS, which basically, um, the, the basic idea behind this is that instead of annual surveys, you create an online stream of data every day. You get organizational health and employee engagement data. And then, as a manager, as a leader, I can run interventions based on this data, and I see immediately the positive or negative noise in the data, and I know that my behavioral change is actually driving something positive, or I have to do something different. Um, having said this, what we try to do, we make the human side of work visible. And why we're doing this? We are doing this because you, as a leader, have to be and have to stay relevant in the conversations with your employees. You don't know where they are, but if you would have data which are giving you insights where the engagement level is, or where, what they are missing, you actually can have an informed conversation. And you know conversation is the point in time where engagement happens. Conversation is where you create the connect with the human being. And starting to inform this, and not measure this once a year, but measure this every week, and embarking on a journey where I can improve 1% every week. That's actually what we are aiming for. So, I would like to end with a question. And the reason why I ask this question is, um, change starts with me. So let's assume for a moment we meet in December 2018, and you had a really brilliant time. What will you tell me? You personally have changed in your daily way of working to improve your performance, and how did you measure the improvement? Thank you very much.